Fairy tales as a concept evoke many things to the average consumer. As a subset of folklore, they contain a multitude of cultural shorthands unique to a region or group that contain morals or commentary. As such, we ascribe a certain judgment on the story presented as it demands for its message to be applied on a larger, diverse scale. As a work, it begs for critical analysis while containing a definite and broad meaning meant to be understood by as wide an audience as possible. So sculpting a modern day fairy tale isn't an easy task as it requires a unique story to stand up against the millennia of human experience telling such stories. Which brings me to Wandering Witch, The Journey of Elaine, as a Japanese take on a European mythos telling transcendent stories. What makes a fairy tale a fairy tale? Paraphrasing Stith Thompson, an American scholar of folklore, fairy tales move in an unreal world without definite locality or creatures, and are filled with marvels. The characters and motifs of fairy tales are simple and archetypal, with prohibitions and breaking of said prohibitions. Wandering Witch follows the same structure. In a world where magic exists and countries are plentiful with their own cultures, kings, laws, and quirks, ravaged by magical monsters, plants, crimes, and even the past itself, we follow characters given one or two defining traits as Elaine journeys. For example, Elaine happens upon a boy, this mage who happens to be the local mayor's son and is trying to gather things that make people and animals happy. He does that so he can give those feelings to a girl he has a crush on. We have our black and white moral absolutes established in this moment, with the simple task of bringing joy to someone who is sad. However, we find out when meeting her that she's not just a simple servant girl that the mayor took in as we were led to believe. She's a slave he purchased to cook and clean. This sets up the prohibitions, as the mayor's son cannot marry a slave as his father won't allow it. Having our bounds and prohibitions, it's established the cast for the short story. A light-hearted son who doesn't know his crush is his property, a father who abuses the girl, and the girl who's given up hope due to her situation. As we see this unfold, we aren't really given a resolution, as Elaine recounts this, reminding her of a story she had heard previously, about a mage who wanted to please his dying wife by getting images of the most beautiful places he could, and when he showed those to her, she was reminded how she could never see them in person, and it deepened her depression, eventually leading her to commit suicide. This leaves us with a cautionary tale, that because you're doing something for someone else, that doesn't necessarily make it right. Elaine doesn't know what happened after that, and goes further. She corrects herself, saying that she doesn't want to know. That adds to the air of mystery, and deepens the message. Because we don't have the definite resolution, but we can certainly infer it. And that's one example of the structure this series uses, outlining the moral oppositions, showing the line that should not be crossed, introducing a gray area, and ultimately showing the consequences crossing the line leaves. Whether that's good or bad isn't always clear, as while the example given has a depressing ending one wouldn't consider showing their children, others have a more positive message about overcoming adversity, and even nuanced stories about the value lies have in maintaining relationships. And while the messages aren't profound or unique, as some are common enough in fiction, the way these vignettes cover their messages is certainly unique, as it relies on the internal logic and culture of the world it's set in, pulling the viewers in so they can see it from their perspective. Applying many of the stories in this series to the Thompson's Motif Index, an index that's used to categorize the many tropes used in folklore, and yes, that is the same Thompson from earlier in the video we see how many themes they share with other fairy tales. Any particular tale from this series, we see a number fit, from tests, deceptions, rewards and punishment, unnatural cruelty, and taboo, with a plethora of subsections and tropes that match in even deeper detail. The example of the mayor's son and his crush from before fits the person sold into slavery, class taboos, unnecessary choices, absurd ignorance, a ton more tropes shared with folklore that are echoed in this series. And that gives the old cautionary tale, or sometimes hopeful message, about how fantastical things do happen. But structurally, how does it keep the spirit of a fairy tale? Much like any other collection of stories in our world, the series sets up the basic framing device of the main character setting out on a journey, the nature of which is purely self-indulgent and aimless, allowing her to come into contact with a number of different scenarios that are self-contained stories proposing different morals. This gives the viewers an audience surrogate and protagonist to experience these with while giving a connective thread to tie the anthology together. 
This also allows the protagonist to stay neutral in their position, not imposing their specific moral compass onto the stories presented. Elaine is an archivist to these events, rather than the one experiencing them. These aren't her stories, she's just the one there to witness them. This harkens back to the roots of keeping folklore stories as an oral tradition, where the audience is told the stories directly from the protagonist as she writes them down in her journal for later curation. This is the process of a folklorist, someone who gathers old stories, myths, and traditions, and records them for broad distribution. Though we do see that she's gathering these as first-hand experience for these stories. In essence, Elaine is her world's version of the Brothers Grimm, taking every experience she has and writing it down for future generations to share in the cultural significance. Wandering Witch isn't just a story about other stories. It's trying to capture the feeling of creating a new mythology. It's showing those scary, disturbing, or even fun moments from stories we were told growing up that have invaded the cultural zeitgeist to build their own new fairy tales that convey the same emotions. In a way, this is a modern-day Brothers Grimm, without having the cultural heritage to draw upon, instead pulling from Norse, Spanish, Italian, German, and British aesthetics and cultures to spin its own lore that we, the viewers, are privy to. The fact that this wasn't a retelling of fairy tales and instead strove to make its own, has this one stand out as truly unique, and capturing the essence of what makes a fairy tale. Hey, you made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with the link down in the description. And if you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks like voting on what I do next. Thanks for watching.